Welcome in to the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. Yeah, you can have Penix, Patricia. <laughs> Who says I want him? I had to put a chip down of one player in this draft to go to the Hall of Fame. Who's my pick? And it's Marvin Harrison Jr. The Locked On Podcast Network presents the 2024 NFL Mock Draft Special. Sponsored by LinkedIn. Welcome to the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. This is episode three of a six-episode series that will take you through the entire first round of the NFL Draft with unparalleled insight from the local experts of all 32 teams here at the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And don't worry if your favorite team doesn't select in the first round. We've got you covered too. Every team's top selection, whenever that may be. An inside look from all 32 of your local NFL shows and several of our college shows as well. We'll also get team building insight from the draft dudes and fantasy insight from our locked on fantasy experts for some of the biggest selections in this year's draft. And of course, we are your hosts. I'm Brian Peacock, NFL analyst and co host of the Peacock and Williamson NFL show and locked on 49ers. Here with me are my co host, former NFL scout Matt Williamson. And this year, things just keep getting better. Joining Matt and I, our NFL Draft experts, Keith Sanchez and Damian Parson from the outstanding Locked On NFL Draft podcast. This Locked On NFL Mock Draft special is sponsored by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Locked On NFL terms and conditions apply. And we are on the clock now. Alex Clancy of Locked On Cardinals getting ready to go with the 11th selection in this mock draft for the Arizona Cardinals, and you might be wondering why they're picking 11. Well, swung a trade. The Minnesota Vikings moved up in a previous episode of this mock draft to go from 11 to pick number four to get their quarterback of the future. And just to remind you of those picks before we get going with the first of three Cardinals selections now in the first round of this mock draft, no surprise at all at number one, the Chicago Bears selecting Caleb Williams, cornerback out of USC, Washington Commanders, Jaden Daniels going QB, LSU, New England Patriots, Drake May, back to back to back to back quarterbacks with those Minnesota Vikings moving up to four and selecting J.J. McCarthy there. Los Angeles Chargers going with Marvin Harrison Jr. with the fifth selection in this mock draft. New York Giants selecting Roma Dunze at number six. The Tennessee Titans coming back with Joe Alt, the first offensive lineman off the board at pick number seven. Malik Neighbors, the third wide receiver in this draft, going to the Atlanta Falcons at pick number eight. And the first defensive player off the board to the Chicago Bears, Dallas Turner, edge rusher out of Alabama at nine. Then Olu Fashanu, uh, off the tackle for Penn State to the New York Jets, which brings us to pick number 11, and gentlemen, before we get to the Arizona Cardinals at pick number 11, going through those first 10 selections in this draft, do you think it's possible that the Chicago Bears, who are kind of running this thing with the first pick and having two picks in the top 10, is it possible they turn their entire franchise around with this class, getting potentially what the Houston Texans got last year with a superstar quarterback and then following it up with a dynamic edge rusher, the two more most important positions on the football field? Uh I saw a little reaction from you, Damian, there. Um, is that too lofty of a goal for the Chicago Bears in this draft? Um, compare, uh, combining what they did in free agency, I don't think so, right? Being able to get Keenan Allen uh, from the from the Los Angeles Chargers, bringing in DeAndre Swift, now having Caleb Williams walk in, bringing, you know, you already have Montez Swift from the midseason trade last year. I think this team is vastly improved. Uh, through free agency and from what they've done through the first two picks that they have in the 2024 NFL draft that we can see them battling with the Packers and the Lions for not just the top of the NFC North, but a playoff berth. I don't think it's crazy. I mean, Houston had a new head coach too. I mean, it was a total makeover. I mean, from the doldrums where they were at in the Watson era and all that. But this Bears team, too, I mean, kind of the underreported story was their defense was exceptional in the second half of the season, especially after the trade for Sweat. And now they've added to it. There's a lot around a young quarterback. So, yes, I mean, it's it's going to be a franchise altering draft one way or another without question. 
Yeah, and I think when you can talk about the player and the skill set, right, but it's also a mentality, right? Like, it's, it's a culture change, and I think that's what we've seen happen in Houston, and I think that's going to be the questions, right? Caleb Williams stepping into Chicago, and then can Dallas turn them have that never-say-die uh, type of mentality that we've known Will Anderson to have? So I think it's going to be more so which – can those guys step in the building as rookies and say, you know what, we have – the, you know, we're going to become the voice of the locker room. We want to become, you know, the kings of the North and, and win the NFC North. So much draft capital now for the Arizona Cardinals. You mentioned the culture change in Houston and uh, in Chicago, and we've seen that over the last 12 months or so with the new regime with the Arizona Cardinals. Now they got three picks to work with in this class. What do you guys like for the Cardinals as the board fell here at pick number 11? Matt, what is the what is the plan for the Cardinals with these three picks? Are you just going best player available? They have a lot of needs. That's a thing. I mean, so no matter who they take here, though, Yes, they have a ton of draft capital, and they have a lot of draft capital outside of round one, even before this trade down. So they're going to make a lot of picks. They have a lot of flexibility to trade back up if they so choose, et cetera, et cetera. Now, no one knows when you trade down who you're going to get, but I kind of look at this with a little bit of hindsight saying, wouldn't I would just rather have Marvin Harrison and just have a total superstar, you know what I mean, as opposed to a bunch of pieces? Agreed. Oh, 100% yeah. agree, Matt. That's where I was going to go with it as well. Trading down from four to 11, when you already have, what, five to six top 100 picks, you got two first round mm -hmm. picks, one in the top five, the other one, you know, in the top 32 as well. And like trading back and getting an extra pick, we've seen this happen. We've seen the Cleveland Browns have, what, three first round picks before and kind of blow through. We've seen other teams do that. More opportunities doesn't always mean more opportunities just for success. It means all more opportunities for failure. And when you trade out, not only did you miss on Marvin Harrison, guys, you missed on Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze. And one of yeah. your biggest weaknesses is receiver. Kyler's looking at the, the Chargers like, well, you guys, clear, they clearly care about more, more about Justin Herbert. You guys care about me because they gave Herbert Marvin Harrison Jr. And now we'll see what they gave Kyler Murray. I agree 100%. That's exactly where I was going with that, Damien, is that you just three opportunities to get it wrong, right? And, and sometimes we know that there's sometimes there's elite level players. And if you have opportunity to get it, like let's forget all the wheeling and dealing, stay put at pick four, right? And, and get who you want to get. And I'm, I, my point is also is that this is kind of a weird spot, right? Unless you're going offensive line, it's like, are you completely sold on taking a cornerback? Are you willing to bump one of these wide receivers up? Do you feel comfortable with taking an interior defensive lineman? And my answer is kind of no, no, and no. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, hey, why have more draft capital? I would have liked to just have Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, for the Cardinals, the key is that 2025 first round pick because the Minnesota Vikings are a team that's going to start either Sam Darnold for some or all of the season or a rookie quarterback. That might be a pretty high pick. So mm -hmm. maybe you can get your Marvin Harrison Jr. Jr. Uh, in the 2025 class. That's I don't know. So that's a that's a big key to me. You guys are the draft experts. Who are you looking at next season? Is is that is that a I mean, that's your year three, three though already of the rebuild. I mean, pretty soon you gotta start winning games. And, winning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are you, are you gonna be packing your boxes? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out what Alex Clancy's gonna do here with the first of his three first round selections in this draft, and then we'll wait a year to find out what he does next year in uh, the 2025 mock draft special with potentially a, a high pick from the Minnesota Vikings. Alex Clancy, ready to go with the 11th selection in the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. After trading back with the Minnesota Vikings to acquire the number 11 and number 23 picks in the 2024 draft and a first-round pick in 2025, with the 11th pick, the Arizona Cardinals select Quinion Mitchell, cornerback, Toledo. Long have been the days that the Arizona Cardinals have been without a bona fide cornerback one. 2015 Patrick Peterson was almost a decade ago. And while the former regime pretty much punted on building talent in the cornerback room, Monty Osford and Jonathan Gannon know where they need their talent dispersed. And the Cardinals may have taken the best corner in the draft, dropping to 11 because of the quarterback heavy front of this draft. The Cardinals have found an absolute gem who is poised to lead the cornerback room into actual relevancy, infusing talent, youth, and probably the best corner in the 2024 NFL draft.
Quinion Mitchell, cornerback out of Toledo. He has aced the pre-draft process, senior bowl, workouts at the Combine. Fantastic prospect. As a listener of Locked On NFL Draft, I know you guys kind of disagree maybe who the top corners are and maybe the evaluations of some of these guys. And I think every team's draft board is going to be different with some of these cover guys. Damien, is Quinion Mitchell the next Patrick Peterson? <laughs> That's a, uh, those are big shoes to fill. BP, uh, I don't want to go and say that, but I will say this. He is my highest great tie from my highest graded corner right now, along with Clemson's Nate Wiggins at the moment. But for me, it's like looking at him and putting him in this Jonathan Gannon defense. He can play press man. He can play off man. He can play zone, outstanding eyes and vision and discipline, ball skills, trigger, athleticism, size. He has everything you want to be a number one corner in the NFL, and I think the developmental upside is also there in his favor as well as you start putting him in more of those tight man-to-man at the line of scrimmage situations. And with everything he has in his at his disposal with his skill set, with his intelligence, um, I really like the pick. Like I said, if you can't get one of these receivers, you do need to get a difference maker in the secondary, and that was something that they've been missing since Patrick Peterson your best DB has been Buda Baker, which is a great thing, but you still got to cover on the outside. And I think that Quinion Mitchell gives them that. Not your CB1, Keith? No. And, and so I have a group of guys who CB1, right? And that may be part of my issue with this pick. And it was something that Alex said at the very end, right? He said that this is probably the best cornerback in the draft, right? If that I'm taking the... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Peterson wasn't probably the best corner in the draft. Right. right? Yep. Right. And if and if I'm moving off of Marvin Harrison Jr., who I know for sure can step in, right, and be one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, if I'm going to take a cornerback and he's the first corner off the board, I don't want to feel probably. I want to know for sure yeah. that this guy's the best cornerback in the draft. So not an issue necessarily with the player like Quinion Mitchell for every reason that DP just outlined, but maybe potentially I would want to potentially trade back even more if I can get more draft capital. And then there's a group of guys that I feel like can probably, uh, you know, I has come up with the same results that a Quinion Mitchell could come up with. And BP, I got one last thing to throw in here too, is we, we talk about this on our show. I've brought it up many times that if you're the team or the second team, or even the third team in this particular draft, taking defenders off the board, I don't think you're super comfortable with it, you know, because these aren't Patrick Peterson. This isn't Nick Bosa, you know I mean? Yep. They're, they're good players, you know, but yeah, uh, I, I don't love to the first defender off the board teams in this draft. Yep. The debate in the Locked On NFL war room is who is cornerback one, just as we're debating here in this class. Louis DiBiase from Locked On Eagles starts making the case. I think he's right there Got with it. Terry and Arnold where you can say he's CB1 in this class. Yeah, I mean, that's a little higher than I thought he was going to go, but after he showed his ability to play like press man coverage at the Senior Bowl because he was mostly a zone quarterback or corner in college, yeah, I I'm totally cool with this pick. I remember watching Ohio State last year to watch CJ Stroud and I watched their game against Toledo and I was like, who is this random corner who's sticking with Marvin Harrison? Like Harrison Jr. was still beating him. Like, don't get me wrong. But I was like, who is this random corner who is sticking with him and like contesting everything? And then a year later, everyone's talking about Quinion Mitchell. It's like, oh, that was the guy, you know, a top 10, top 15 type guy. Makes a lot of sense. But yeah, Quinion Mitchell, he gets he gets after it, was was killing at the senior bowl. Uh, tested out of his out of this world. I mean, he's just been killing this pre-draft process. Really, really good player. Not some random corner out of Toledo. Put some respect on his name. First round cornerback, the first off the board, Quinion Mitchell. Cornerback going now to the Arizona Cardinals at 11. That brings us to the Denver Broncos at pick 12, guys. And is this where we see the fifth quarterback off the board? Is it too early for Bo Nix? Is it too early for Michael Penix? Uh Guys, Keith, where are you guys at on the on the next group of corner uh, quarterbacks in this class? And if not a quarterback, what direction do the Broncos go here as well? Yeah, if you if you look at value and we're talking about big boards, right, then the, the next set of quarterbacks probably wouldn't come off for me until the 20s, right, somewhere in that range. But if you look at the Denver Broncos as currently constructed, they have to go quarterback in this situation, right? They were not extremely active in free agency. You got rid of Russell Wilson. Sean Payton is there. The wide receiver core is completely obliterated from when Sean Payton stepped in. And it's, this offense just simply needs a direction. So I think they have to go quarterback now, whether they go 
Michael Penix Jr. or they go Bo Nix. Um, it has to be somebody that Sean Payton is completely confident in. And one thing we know with those NFL coaches, right, is that if, if they deem themselves as, as guys that can develop, you know, the Drew Brees and I had, you know, a couple decent years with Jameis Winston, I feel like he looks at either one of these quarterbacks and say, hey, I can get this out of that quarterback and develop him into a really good football player. Bo Nix, Matt, is it too early? Are you forcing it if you're putting a quarterback here just because you have the big need? You can, so move, I, you can, move, you can move down here. You can move up later. You don't have to force the quarterback if you don't believe in him. I do like the fit, though, potentially with Bo Nix, maybe even more than Penix, just for Sean Payton's offense. For Payton, I do too. But I'll be honest. I mean, I lump these next two teams together all the time, Denver and Vegas. They're both in mm -hmm. Mahomes' division. They're both in quarterback no man's land. I think they both could be in contention for the first overall pick next year. I mean, like, I would not want to be the GM of either one of these teams right now. They have needs galore. And I think they might do something what I think is foolish or stupid and overdraft a quarterback in some way, shape, or form. That's not for me throwing them into this situation. Before we crush the Broncos too hard, let's find out what the actual pick is here from Locked On Broncos. Sarah Bettinger ready to go with the pick at number 12 in the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. With the 12th pick in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft, the Denver Broncos select Brock Bowers, tight end from Georgia. Now, why would the Broncos pick a tight end in the first round of the 2024 NFL Draft without a franchise quarterback in place? Well, obviously, in this mock draft, the quarterbacks flew off the board early. And while there is a chance that Sean Payton and George Payton, the brain trust in Denver, could end up falling in love with somebody like Bo Nix of Oregon, you got to take the best player available here and potentially try and get yourself that quarterback a little bit later on. Now, the Broncos are in a tricky position. They don't have a second round pick. So in an ideal world, maybe they could take a Brock Bowers here and trade up for Bo Nix at the end of the first round of this draft. And that's not entirely impossible. But what are you getting here? You obviously need weapons for your quarterback no matter when and where you get him, right? So you need to have a tight end. As George Payton said at the NFL Combine, the Broncos need a tight end that can work over the middle of the field, and Brock Bowers can do a lot more than that. This is a guy that could take on a high volume of targets. He can win after the catch. He can win at the catch point. He can win in the red zone. He's very crafty in the open field. The Broncos just need playmakers offensively. And if the Broncos are really as confident in Jarrett Stidham as they're making Making it seem this guy will help the offense get to another level this coming season. So pass on the quarterback here. It's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow, but Brock Bowers out of Georgia, he's the right type of player if you're going to do that in this scenario. See, we got some smart folks here on the Locked On Podcast Network. They're not going to force the quarterback going BPA. Fantastic fit, right, Matt, for Sean Payton's offense with the tight end out of Georgia, Brock Bowers. Yeah, I like this approach a lot, and I haven't seen Bowers link to Denver, but I like it quite a bit. Uh, I wouldn't have crushed them if they went corner, if they went any uh, O-line. I mean, those are premium positions for a team that needs everything. And like the Raiders, I'd much rather th these guys be the Will Levis situation, like end the beginning of round, round two, maybe trade up and get Pinnix or Knicks if they're still there. Be patient. Those guys aren't you know franchise changers enough for me to do that. But kind of as you mentioned, I mean, Peyton will scheme the heck out of Bowers. That works out. That works for me. He's not the most impressive height, weight, speed individual out there. Yeah. Keith, can you paint the picture of what kind of prospect Brock Bowers is and why everyone loves him so much? Yeah, I, I absolutely love Brock Bowers as a prospect. Um, All of the George Kittle comps, I'm right there for it. I think this guy uh, with the right volume, be a top five tight end in the NFL. You're talking about run after the catch ability, um, the ability to adjust the football. If you want to know who Brock Bowers is, just cut on the Auburn film. The guy uh, pancaked one of the defenders. He had two one-handed catches, run after catch ability. I, I just think, I think he's a special prospect. Honestly, I, I like him a whole lot. Now, this is the thing, right? And this is where the Denver Broncos placed him himself is that we're still wondering what are they going to do at the quarterback position and it's unfortunate and Matt you talked about the second round right they don't have a second round pick so That's the question point. is will Spencer Rattler or one of these guys be there in the third round for you to snatch up so it's it's not so much about the prospect I love the prospect but I'm still looking at the Denver Broncos and Matt I'm right there with you that this could be a team picking in the top three Ooh. next year because of how how many holes they have in the quarterback position not being solved 
they may have been the team that needed to trade back so they could get a second round pick. You know what I mean? Right. Like just it's a <laughs> such a t- tough situation, Keith. We always talk about it on the Locked On NFL Draft. It's like preparing your team to draft a quarterback. So I'm glad they didn't take one because I don't think they're ready for one right now. And I don't want to put a rookie quarterback who nine times out of ten, if you really make it an open competition, beats out a Jared Stidham in camp to where you're like. What's the phrase? If it's close, you go with the rookie. Like, that's typically what happens. If you're in camp and you're looking at Jared Stidham versus a rookie QB and the rookie QB is right on nipping at his heels, you're going to go with the rookie QB nine times out of ten. But this team is nowhere near prepared to battle with Mahomes or anyone in the AFC at the top to really make a berth for the playoffs right now. So getting Brock Bowers, a guy like, like Matt said, that Sean Payton can scheme up, I view him more of – I don't view him as a traditional tight end at 6'3", 230. I view him more as a power slot. You detach him from the line, and you just give him those those volumes. If you're going to run block him, pull him off the line of scrimmage, let him be that slice blocker on all the split flow action, stuff like that. I don't want him to a lot of man-to-man blocking, but his pass-catching prowess – it's going to make whoever's at quarterback easy with the way that Sean Payton can scheme things up. The nest being built for the future quarterback, whenever that may come for yeah, yeah. those Denver Broncos. Some past Sean Payton trauma coming back to uh, to, to to bite and, and and maybe some ghosts, some past ghosts for Locked On Saints host Ross Jackson uh, with this pick. Let's check in on the Locked On NFL War Room. That is such I'm, a Sean That is Payton such pick. a Sean Payton such pick. Such a Sean Payton pick. This is this is first round Adam Troutman without having to trade away your entire day three to the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> I forgot all about that. <laughs> that that trade like is why the Vikings have like an insane free agency this year because they lost like 30 players because all those rookie deals finally expired. Yeah. So I like it because, you know, I know he hasn't done a lot right since he's been in Denver, but I like it because we always talk about players. I always say more organizations ruin players than players ruin organizations. So this dude has a history of knowing how to use outlier type players, right? Mm -hmm. With the tight end and Jimmy Graham, who's a basketball player. And then the kid down there, that's a running back, fullback, tight end, linebacker, or whatever he is, you know, Ross's favorite player down there. So, he knows how to get the ball into guys' hands in certain positions. And Brock Byers, whatever you want to say about him, he is a football player. For this fantasy football impact of Brock Bowers to Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos, let's check in with Marcus Mosher of Locked On Dynasty Football. It wouldn't be that surprising to see Brock Bowers go to the Denver Broncos with the number 12 pick. They need more playmakers. Sean Payton has a history of producing big-time fantasy production from the tight end position and Brock Bowers is one of the best overall prospects in this class. He's widely expected to be a top 15 selection, but going to the Denver Broncos who do not have a stable quarterback situation right now with Jared Stidham as the starter as of now would be a big hit for his fantasy production. We believe that Brock Bowers is one of the most pro ready tight ends. He entered the NFL in the last several years. But even though he's going with a coach that is known for producing fantasy talent at the tight end position, not going with an established quarterback does ding him quite a bit. Lower him in your fantasy rankings, especially in redraft leagues. Expect him to be a low-end tight end, too, as a rookie. And then hopefully in your dynasty leagues, the Broncos can figure out the quarterback situation and get him somebody that can accurately get him the football down the field. So overall, this is a bad destination for Brock Bowers' fantasy value, but it is a good pick for the Broncos here at number 12. All right, Marcus knows his stuff. The Locked On Dynasty podcast is a premier, premier podcast on the Locked On Network, especially on Wednesdays. You should should chime in there as well. Mm -hmm. But I disagree. I I mean, I don't see – I think Bowers might lead the Broncos in receptions next year. I mean, they're going to be losing all the time. I I have no hope for this team (laughs) next year. I, I don't think there's much competition in terms of pass catchers. And Peyton's going to scheme him up to no one's to no end. I mean, this is his guy. I trust Sean Payton and I trust Bowers. I don't care about the quarterback. Should be some targets there for Brock Bowers, yeah. even as a rookie. Uh, even though it does take some tight tight end some time in the NFL to develop. The Broncos surprised some by not taking a quarterback. Will the Las Vegas Raiders follow suit, or will we see a fifth passer off the board at all? We've got your boy Q from Locked On Raiders standing by to make his selection next. 
The Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for a small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Quarterback here, it's kind of the same conversation, right, with where these organizations are, pick 12 with the Broncos, pick 13 with the Las Vegas Raiders. I don't know if it's any more likely that a quarterback goes here at number 13. Uh, Keith, what's what's the biggest needs for the Raiders here? Where do you go? What's best player available now as we get to the 13th pick in this mock draft? Yeah, I, if I'm the Las Vegas Raiders, I probably try to continue to establish a culture of toughness, right, under head coach Antonio Pierce. And I think the safest pick or safest value at this part in the draft is they need a quarterback, but I probably go offensive line and I just choose to re reboot my offensive line, continue to get, you know, I guess improve at that position. So I'm going offensive line right here if I'm the Las Vegas Raiders. Still some phenomenal offensive linemen on the board, too. We've only seen two off the board. It's Fashionu. And it's uh, it's Joe Alt. So the, this could be where our run begins with that position group. Do you have a favorite offensive lineman left, Damian, in this class? Uh, to, to pair what Keith's talking about, I want to be physical and add more physicality. You got to think about Oregon State right tackle, Talese Fuaga, one of the more physical and violent guys in this draft on the offensive line in terms of run blocking, heavy handed. He's an outstanding competitor. We saw him down at the Senior Bowl, willing to take on any cha challenge in one on ones. I think about either him or JC Latham. You know, I'm talking about the guy with the most torque in, in the run game, you know, be able to really body defenders and move guys and displace guys. I think either one of those two, if you're the Raiders and you want to improve this offensive line, especially wanting to run the ball with Zamir White heading into uh in, into the 2024 season with no Josh Jacobs, I think either Fuaga or JC Latham will be an outstanding fit for them. Your boy Q ready to go with the selection for the Las Vegas Raiders at pick 13 in the Locked On Mock Draft Special. With the 13th pick in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft, the Las Vegas Raiders select Terion Arnold, cornerback, Alabama. Now, I went with Terion Arnold from Alabama at the number 13th overall pick after multiple efforts to get up to the number two spot for the Raiders to select their quarterback of the future in Jaden Daniels, but it was a no-go when it comes to the Washington Commanders and the Raiders coming to an agreement. So I thought, why not go ahead the way that the mock draft is shaken out and go get an alpha dog at the secondary position. The Raiders had a really good defense in 2023. Head coach Antonio Pierce has mentioned, talked about multiple times, how he needs that alpha dog across from Jack Jones and Nate Hobbs, a couple members of the Raiders secondary that they have right now. You get Terry on Arnold, a guy with all the confidence in the world, a guy with a lot of ball production, all of a sudden you have a very stingy secondary to go with that defensive line led by Christian Wilkins, Max Crosby, and last year's number one overall pick, well, seventh overall pick in the first round, Tyree Wilson. So the Raiders get an alpha dog in their secondary with cornerback Terry on Arnold out of Alabama. And it is cornerback going defense is the Las Vegas Raiders at pick 13. Terry on Arnold, cornerback out of Alabama. Damian, you talked about your corners and how you had them ranked. Where does Terry and Arnold fit in here with this group? Is he worthy of a top 13 pick in the NFL draft? Um, I think I think he's he's up there, right? He's he's one of my like he's running at third, fourth spot, battling up over there with uh Cooley with his teammate, Cooley McKinstry. I think what he brings is toughness, right? A guy that's a very willing tackler in the run game. You pop on, I think it was the SEC championship game against his Georgia. They try it's like fourth and one. They throw a toss sweep out to his side. He blows up the block, makes a big tackle on a bigger running back that's trying to work downhill on him. A guy that's really fluid in terms of his movement, being able to uh, swivel and flip his hips, turn, and be able to run with, with uh, receivers. But he's got really good ball skills, really competitive. And for a guy who's played safety and corner, you could throw him into the nickel. You could do a lot of different things with him in terms of coverage. I like the pick. I think he it would be a, a Tony Pierce type of pick if he's trying to add another corner to his room. 
And Matt, they've been trying to fix that secondary for a long time in Las Vegas. And uh, even though it's not a, a big player that they drafted, still some toughness. How do you like the fit for, for Arnold with the Raiders? I don't have a lot of qualms with it. I mean, the back seven, particularly corner, needed addressed. And this is a team that has plenty of needs, but they did fix their defensive line, spent money there. Um, I think the offense, as we talked about before they made the pick, is really weak on the right side of the O-line. I mean, I think DJ Fluker is penciled in as a right guard. I mean, I didn't even know he was still in the league. And, you know, Fawaga or Latham would have been my pick. But splitting hairs, Arnold's a good fit as well. A lot of NFL fans didn't really know much about Terry on Arnold until the combine. So for more on what he brings to his new team, let's check in with Luke Robinson of Locked On Bama. Terry on Arnold. Look, there are a lot of guys to love on this Alabama team. Jalen Milrow became certainly a fan favorite at times. Um, obviously, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Dallas Turner, all great players. Don't get me wrong. But Terry on Arnold may be my favorite player on this team, not just for his athletic prowess. And he is super athletic. He also is still learning this position while making All-American honors. That's a big deal, and I think that's huge for an NFL team that may draft him thinking, okay, he's not a finished product. He can get a lot better, and we are the ones that can mold him the way we want to mold him. I think that's important, um, but he's fast enough. Four or five, he's not a blazer, but four or five is still very fast. But the thing you're going to love about Terry Arnold is he's going to be a pillar of whatever community he goes to. He, he, People are going to latch to him and gravitate towards him, and he's going to be a team leader. You cannot dislike Terry Arnold as a person, and you really can't dislike him very much as a player. I praise for Terry Arnold from Luke Robinson there of Locked On Bama. We're halfway through this episode of the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. Let's hear from Kyle Krabs and Joe Marino, the draft dudes, the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast for their analysis through 13 picks. Joe, we have a mini corner run starting here just outside the top 10 with Quinya Mitchell and Terry Arnold of two of the last three picks. How do you feel that value lines up for those players relative to what we saw go off inside the top 10? I think the value is fine. I thought Quinion Mitchell had a chance to be the first defensive player off the board. I think the range for him is fine. And I also think that Terry and Arnold going number 13 to the Raiders makes a lot of sense to me as well. It's just a matter of did those teams maximize their opportunities with these draft selections where I always find myself being nervous about the trenches. And I feel like both of those teams had opportunities, whether it was Arizona and the defensive line or Vegas and their offensive line, where that right side just <laughs> makes me all kinds of concerned. I wonder if maybe there was some different directions that I would have went with those selections, although I do think the valuation of both those corners is perfectly fine here just outside the top 10. Well, I think that's what makes it tough, right, is is Arizona and Las Vegas are teams that have multitude of needs. Yeah. And, you know, corner is considered a premium position, just like the offensive line. And we kind of saw the first – a tier of offensive tackles come off the board. You certainly don't see a lot of interior offensive linemen go off in this range of the draft. So I think addressing needs is is fine. And then you have the, the total inverse of that with Denver drafting perceived best player available, just allowing the board to come to them and pick them a player in, in Brock Bowers tight end. Certainly they have a vacancy in that position, but uh, uh, the consensus best player available pick for them whoever's going to be playing quarterback amidst the uh, changing of the guard at wide receiver for them after the Jerry Judy trade and uh, kind of shuffling the deck at, at wide receiver, they now get Brock Bowers in the mix there for them as a primary pass catcher. Yeah, the question now becomes, if Bo Nix doesn't go to Denver at 12, does he have a spot in this first round? That's going to be a fascinating storyline to pay attention to, but is Greg Dulcich still there? I mean, are we, have we forgotten about him and how good he was as a rookie? I'm excited to see what he looks like coming back, but it's hard to argue that they just didn't pick the best player available. And Brock Bowers is a really exciting prospect. I think he aligns with so much of where this tight end position in the NFL is, is gravitating towards and just kind of has a Sean Payton feel to it, if we're being honest about that selection. Yeah, so Brock Bowers, a couple of corners. Be fascinating to see where this draft takes its next turn as we've kind of started to see the Levy's open for uh, defensive side of the football, some non-premium positions. You're outside the top 12, uh, and, and it kind of becomes a more no-holds-barred type of approach at this stage of the draft. 
That brings us to the New Orleans Saints. We're picking 14 in this NFL draft, and those sneaky Saints always moving around. Do they ever select in their normal spot every year? They tried to get up earlier. Ross Jackson locked on Saints. I know there's some talks about him going up to try to get an offensive tackle. Still some good offensive linemen on the board, but the Philadelphia Eagles were trying to trade up with this spot with the Saints as well. So let's go to the locked on war room here. Locked on Eagles host Gino Camilleri. Uh, he's he's talking him and, and co-host Louis DiBiase. They're, they're trying to trade up here to to pick number 14. I don't know if they're going to be successful. Yeah, Ross, we want 14. Got, the Eagles want 14. All right. What do you what do you what are you thinking? Lou, drum it up. So I was going to offer pick 22, the 120th pick in the fourth round and a third in 2025. Hmm. Let me consult my trade charts. I'm feeling like that's going to come in a little low. You said 22, throw in a fifth as well, if you'd like. You said uh, 22, 120. In the fourth. And... could throw a fifth rounder in there and then a third in 2025. Oh, man, I think you can come off of one of them. I think you can come off of 22 and 53, can't you? You know what your general manager gave up for Trevor Penning, right? I know what my general, I know <laughs> what, I know what Mickey Loomis gave up. You're talking to Ross Jackson. All right. Oh, we're, okay. we, do, right. we do business. <laughs> we do business different. Do you know, here, I don't know about right? you, but I don't think I want to move 53. No. Yeah, I think I'm good. Love that insight. Ross, the boss. He, he's, <laughs> not playing around you know you got to come off 53 i like that uh do you think do you guys think the 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 saints should move down here N not exactly what they, they do right i think there was value <laughs> i think there's value if they move down but this was so much bigger than draft picks right ross had to stand on business for the entire saints organization because we know what the eagles did in the past couple of years fleecing the new orleans saints out of draft picks and then turning those into jail and carter and those type of guys while we went and got trevor penning so uh ross had to stand on business for the new orleans saints organization <laughs> i wonder what the eagles are going up to try to get i i really feel yeah, i like think it's wiggins i mean two corners just mm -hmm. fell i think they want to go mm -hmm. get that corner okay That's corner, what I was maybe. yeah the Saints guys, uh, it looks like they are going to stay here and not trade out of pick number 14. Two offensive tackles are on the board. Obvious need. I, I think there's some value here, right? With We've already brought up multiple names of, of offensive tackles that could potentially be a fit for the Saints. They could use a guy on the left side or the right side now. And that's the conundrum they're in, right? You need a spot. You need a tackle for both sides right now because Trevor Penning hasn't worked out. Ryan Ramchick has the injury that we don't know when he's going to be fully cleared to return the football activities and be game, uh, game ready to to play. So you kind of look at the situation like, well, if we're going to be here, I'm a draft a tackle at either spot. It doesn't really matter whether it's J.C. Latham or Talise Fuaga. You have you still have you know Troy Faltanu. Um, there's Kingsley Sue Matia from BYU, Tyler Guyton, Amarius Mims. There's still a litany of tackles that are still available that can play both sides. So I think that that offensive line has to be the pick for them. Yeah, I think that's what made that pick 54 so important, right? And I think if the Eagles were willing to give that up for this year, I would have been with the trade, right? Because then you can address offensive tackle in the first round, and then you can go back to the well again in the second round. And like you said, potentially pick up one of these offensive tackles that fall and have a left tackle and a right tackle moving forward. And by the way, guys, the Saints have not traded back since 2007. So, yeah, we're... we're wow. It's been a little, it's been a while. Years. Yeah, we're gonna get close to twenty years since they've gone backwards. They they go up, and Ross Jackson standing on business at pick number fourteen. That pick is in. Let's go to the locked on Saints war room and host Ross Jackson. With the 14th selection in the twenty twenty four locked on NFL mock draft, the New Orleans Saints select Troy Fatanu, offensive lineman out of. Washington. This guy was a target for me coming into the draft. He's got tackle guard versatility, but with those 34 and a half inch arms should quiet a lot of the concerns about him being able to play tackle at the next level. Six foot three though, maybe doesn't necessarily fit there for you. But the thing that I really like about Fatano is that you have 
the choices, right? The New Orleans Saints, they went in, they drafted Trevor Penning a couple years ago. The experiment has not worked out thus far. And so finding somebody that's got that guard tackle versatility when you have another guy that is starter quality and James Hurst already on the roster with that tackle guard versatility as well just gives you a lot of options. And the other thing that I love about Fotano is that he is the epitome of what the New Orleans Saints offensive line wants to be going into 2024 with their new wide zone offensive system. He's athletic. He's expert. Explosive. He's got the long arms. He checks a lot of the boxes. And in my opinion, he was a top 15 player coming into this draft because there was no way he was getting past pick 14. Troy Feltanu, offensive tackle from Washington. And we talked about needing a left tackle, needing a right tackle. Feltano's the most versatile offensive lineman in this draft. He's got five position versatility potentially. But uh, I like him at left tackle. I, I think he should stay right where he was in college. Ross laid it out perfectly. He's got that arm length. And so I don't think length is a problem, even though he's sub six foot four. He's got great feet. He moves like a running back through the hole when he's trying to, you know, get on the move and block on the move. So I love that. He's got the long arms and uh, athleticism to hold up on the edge. And, and at the very least, you let him fail there first before we move him inside. Keith, am I crazy for thinking that Faltano is a, a left tackle to start his career in the NFL? Nah, man, they say, they say great minds think alike, right? And I feel exactly that way. And listen, the, the threshold or the floor is, is he better than Trevor Penning, right? Because you need to improve the left side of the offense line. And I think that he immediately comes in and he's better than Trevor Penning. And then I, you, when you have multiple needs along the offensive line, I think drafting those versatile guys allows you to put them wherever and then you work work on filling the other holes. So now you get your best five out there and try to significantly improve this offensive line. So I like the Troy Fontano pick. Damien, what's the scouting report here on, on Fontano? How did you like him coming into this class versus the other tackles potentially available? Uh, he for a while he was kind of one of my sleepers. I felt like no one was giving enough love to because people was like, oh, he's shorter. There's question marks about his arm. And I remember tweeting it out a couple months ago. I was like, I just need to know his arm length. And Jim replied, 34 and a half. I said, I'm sold because the footwork is there. He can mirror him and match rushers. He can get to his, his set points. He's got really strong hands. He has, I won't even know if I say arguably, he has the best snatch trap uh, snatch trap maneuver in this class on talk, when you're talking about offensive linemen. I think the main thing for him with his heavy handed, you know, continue to work on his, his latch and, and making sure he, he engages that and starts that early. But I think this is a guy, especially with Derek Carr in the backfield, you want him to feel comfortable when you have speed like Chris Olave and the different playmakers on this uh, on the Saints offense, be able to push the ball down the field. I think Troy Fontano brings that in when you have Kendra Miller. Uh, with, I think they had Jamal Williams last year and Alvin Kamara. You want to run the ball? He's going to help you do that as well. Body bias is not shaking our locked on NFL war room hosts, especially locked on Cowboys host Landon McCool. Love this guy. I, I think he's being talked about as a guard because he is perfect guard sized, but I, I think that he could easily play tackle in a lot of different schemes. And I, I honestly think he could play all five spots. Uh, my only complaint is that I think he's more physical than he is strong at times. Um, but I, I love his game so much. And I think especially in, in a zone based scheme, he could play all five spots probably. The Indianapolis Colts are expecting a big year in 2024 with the return of Anthony Richardson. How will they help him out? The Indianapolis Colts are on the clock in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. I've been told I'm a competitive person, and yeah, I do have a competitive side. We all do, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times and it's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with your friends. And I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Here we go, Fick. Pick 15 in our mock draft, guys, and it's the Indianapolis Colts. You, you're looking on the offensive side. You're looking on the defensive side. Matt, 
put your GM hat on. Uh, what, what direction are you headed? We know Chris Ballard loves himself some high-end athletes. Are there any high-end athletes out there you're eyeing for the, the Colts at pick 15? Yeah, I think corner would have been in the mix. Um, this team doesn't have a lot of glaring needs, but they also don't have a lot of superstars either. You know what I mean? They have a lot of second-round pick type guys. Um, you sort of mentioned it. What I do know for certain is he's going to – be big enough to ride the ride. He's going to look the part, whoever this pick is. And there's a couple, there's a couple options, you know, some D linemen, maybe you could still go with one of the corners. Is it too early for a receiver? Uh, I don't have a great feel for where to go here. I, I think Mitchell or Arnold would have been the obvious choices. Yeah. I think Mitchell, Arnold, Brock Bowers, if he fell to this yeah. spot, would have been, you know, been a big pick for them because that's a spot that they need to improve on the offense. But defensively, I think secondary is a big uh, concern for them. You're hoping that you see consistency with health and play from Juju Brent, who they drafted in round two of last year's draft in 2023. They drafted Darius, um, I forget the kid's the last name, but he was at Senior Bowl last year. I think Shaw. Somewhere there from South Carolina, the cornerback, but he didn't stay on the roster. So they still need cornerback help. Maybe Cooper, maybe Cooper DeGene here in terms of fitting in that into that defensive system very well. It almost fits like a glove. Uh, whereas if he came off the board here, I don't think many people will question it. Yeah, height, weight, speed, Cooper DeGene, scheme fit. Could see that one. Keith, is there a player that stands out to you that could help Anthony Richardson the most? Hmm, that's interesting because you want to look at the height weight and, and if there's a player to help him out, maybe a Xavier Leggett, just because we've seen the Indianapolis Colts, they, they draft these big body guys, right? You talk about Alec Pierce, you're talking about Pittman, right? Um, So potentially maybe another big wide receiver. That that would be my guess for the Indianapolis Colts. If it wasn't a cornerback, like a guy like Nate Wiggins, who, you know, ran a blazing 40 time at the corner position. The pick is in. Zach Hitz standing by with the pick for Locked On Colts at number 15. With the 15th pick in the Locked On NFL mock draft, the Indianapolis Colts select Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU. Look, the Colts need to get more explosive on offense, and Brian Thomas Jr. is exactly that. Over 17 yards per catch last year for the LSU Tigers, over 1,000 yards, and led all of college football with 17 receiving touchdowns. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. is an explosive vertical threat that would pair well with quarterback Anthony Richardson with the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, look, Richardson's got this fantastic arm. Let's let him use it here with a player like Brian Thomas Jr. He would open up the field for receivers, Michael Pittman Jr. and Josh Downs, and be a good complementary player to the overall Colts system uh, that is based around that North Turner vertical passing game. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. is still only, what, 21 years old? Uh, this would be a fantastic addition to a young Colts team that is looking to get younger, better, faster, and more explosive. So Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU, makes this Colts offense one of the better ones on paper going into the next season. So Zach Hicks of Locked On Colts going with Brian Thomas Jr. You're onto something there, Keith, with a, a linear downfield speedy receiver going Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. By the way, Zach, love the Descendants hoodie. Uh, in, 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 with that pick, um, one of my favorite bands from back in the day. Keith, what do you think? Uh, you know that LSU program. You were at the pro day, four three speed, six foot three. What's not to like about Brian Thomas Jr.? Surprising pick. I don't have Brian Thomas ranked this high, but I love the situation for the player and the team. Reason B, I always say that I don't know if I would want Brian Thomas to come in as my wide receiver one immediately. Maybe not even my wide receiver two, but with the wide receivers that's on this roster already with Pittman, Alec Pierce, and then Josh Downs, he can come in as a wide receiver three and then be very specific in his usage as far as being a vertical guy that can take the top off. Then you look at from the team perspective, right? All of their wide receivers are at least 6'3", minus Josh Downs. But then you're talking about a Mo Ali Cox, who's 6'5". Then you're talking about our guy that Jelani Woods, 6'7", tight end. So we talked about Anthony Richardson with potential accuracy issues, right? And how do you kind of negate for that? You get these, these wide receivers who are big body pass catchers, have wide catch radius. And then if he misses, misses high, you have 6'3", wide receivers. So I've never seen Brian Thomas Jr. lock to the I mean, mock to the, the, to the Colts. But I actually like it. I actually like it a whole lot. And then listening to Zach as he explained it, I think is it makes sense. I mean, big arm, get the ball down the field from Anthony Richardson. It could be some fireworks, Damian. Listen, I, I think this is a, a really good fit for this team, right? Alec Pierce 
it's been really inconsistent as that deep ball stretcher for this offense, right? But he's a build-up speed guy. I look at BTJ, Ryan Thomas Jr., he's going to give you more immediate speed. That 4-3-3 three, three is legitimate on tape. But like he said, he also can play above the rim. And I think also factoring in, this run game is going to be really good with Anthony Richardson back in that backfield. It was good in 2023 when you had Zach Moss and Jonathan Taylor. But now a healthy, uh, a healthy Anthony Richardson, healthy Jonathan Taylor, that's a off, that's a run game that you're going to have to rotate that safety down and kind of flood the box, you know what I mean, bring that eighth to ninth defender down low to kind of stop that run game on first and second downs. That's going to give them the explosive advantages in one-on-one -on -one situations. And like you said, Josh Downs gets op more open terrain to run to. Michael Pittman Jr., who's more of a possession receiver, he gets more opportunities in the short to intermediate game. All about building your receiver core like a basketball team. I like the way they're, I like the way they're headed. Over in the Locked On NFL War Room, Locked On Jags host Tony Wiggins is uh, taking off his Jags hat and putting it on a putting a, a different hat on his head. I guess this is my recruiting hat because I remember him as a five star recruit. Mm -hmm. um, he 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 ended up doing everything I thought he was going to do. He's kind of like AJ Green, where he plays. Everything he does seems like it happens at the hash and outside. I don't see a whole bunch of eating up that route tree on crossing routes and all of that stuff. But you know what? I learned this a long time ago. NFL coaches don't worry about what you don't do. They worry about what you can. And they just just do that. If all you got is one step, do that one step all night long and we'll mm. be fine. I think this is a great pick for the Colts. You, you get Brian Thomas going vertical with Anthony Richardson. You have Michael Pittman doing all the other stuff. Josh Downs doing all the other stuff. Just you don't need Brian Thomas to run more than three routes. Seven, eight, nine. That's it. Throw it deep. That's all yep. you got to do. Sounds like they're predicting Randy Moss for the Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> <laughs> if you got that dance step, man, use it. Uh, I like it. Uh, we got Caroline Fenton of Locked On LSU. She's been busy in this year's mock draft. Let's see what she has to say about Brian Thomas Jr. and what he brings to the pros after a big season with the LSU Tigers. Brian Thomas Jr. led all of college football in receiving touchdowns this past year, and he was a nightmare for opposing defensive backs to deal with at LSU, and I don't expect the NFL to be any different. I'm Caroline Fenton of Locked On LSU, and Brian Thomas Jr., I think, is an offensive coordinator's dream in the vertical passing game, in the deep passing game, because Brian Thomas Jr. has a combination of size, and length, 6'3", 210 pounds, but even at that size, he's not awkward, he's not lanky, he's still smooth with it, but he's also got incredible speed. He can stretch the entire field, he can outrun really any DB that you might want to put on him, and he's a great threat in the vertical passing game. He's got the speed, and he's got the ball tracking ability as well. All right, guys, let's finish up this episode with the Seattle Seahawks at pick number 16 and Corbin Smith of Locked On Seahawks standing by with that selection. I see a lot of Troy Fautanu projected here. He's already off the board. Ross screwed that up. If they're looking interior offensive line, potentially he was one of the biggest needs for the Seahawks, but they could go a number of directions. New head coach, so you don't really know what he's exactly trying to put into place. Matt, what do you think the, what do you think the objective is here for the Seahawks in this draft? Yeah, I'm sure they're upset about not keeping Fatano in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, that was a perfect pick with Washington's offensive coordinator now on, on board. Put him at guard. He could Zach Martin it up at guard, and that'd be fine. You know what I mean? More than fine. Now, would you take a Latham or a Fawaga and bump him inside or maybe move him to right tackle when needed or keep JPJ in the Pacific Northwest as well? Maybe that might be a little early. Who knows? But I also think this is a defensive-minded head coach that comes over from the Ravens. Maybe they see some Matabuke in Byron Murphy, perhaps. Ooh, I like that one. But there's another guy out of the Pacific Northwest, Michael Penix. What do you think? Maybe a sneaky Ooh. quarterback spot here? Damian Keith? Uh, it could be, right? Like, you know, Gino, you, whatever quarterback you're bringing in, they're, they're definitely going to be sitting on the bench behind Geno Smith for this, for this year. And that wouldn't be a bad situation, right, where you can kind of bring them in. They learn how to be a pro, hold that clipboard while Gino plays out the rest of what is guaranteed money from that, that two-year – essentially it was a two-year deal that they gave him. 
I I definitely think interior offensive line, right? Like because because coming from Baltimore, Mike McDonald understands the value of running the football. And when you have Kenneth Walker the third and Zach Charbonnet in that backfield, you're gonna want to make sure that the interior offensive line not only can open running lanes for them, but also protect your quarterback. On to the pick. The pick is in Corbin Smith, ready to go for Locked On Seahawks in the 16th selection in the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. With the 16th pick of the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft, the Seattle Seahawks select Jackson Powers Johnson, center from the University of Oregon. Jackson Powers Johnson only was a one-year starter for the Ducks, but he was utterly dominant both as a pass protector and a run blocker last season in Pac-12 play. Didn't give up a single quarterback pressure, according to Pro Football Focus. He's got great athleticism and also packs a mean punch off the line of scrimmage, making him an ideal fit for an NFL offense that's going to be running both zone and gap concepts. He has started games at guard as well as center, making him a flexible piece that could be a day one starter at either position, considering that the Seahawks lost both of their starting guards during free agency, including Damian Lewis going to the Panthers. They've got gaping holes on both sides of their center, who is likely to be a first-time starter as well in Olu Oluwatimi. They need a veteran presence most likely, but they also need an infusion of talent. And Powers Johnson has the charisma, attitude, and talent that this team desperately needs in the middle. Should be a day-one starter, immediately making this a home-run pick for the Seahawks. Physicality on the inside. We're 30, 330 pound center. We don't see a lot of those anymore. The college game is given to smaller and smaller guys. And JPJ, Jackson Powers Johnson, fits the bill of physicality inside for the Seattle Seahawks, Matt. Yeah, I got no qualms with it. I mean, you could say it's a little early for a center, but he's a pretty unique player. Um, there is he is the power, he has the aggression, he has a tone sending mentality for this offense. They are going to run the ball a lot, take deep shots to Metcalf, Lockett, et cetera. Skill position players are pretty good shape to begin with. So, no, I I, I really can't pick a lot of nits with this one. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Matt. I, I think this is a very talented football player, right? And if you're talking about position list football and just grading a football player, he's one of the, the higher ranked football players. So to grab him at this situation would be really good. I think it's a culture type Um you know, fit, right? He's going to come in there. He's going to get back to that Seattle Seahawks where they were gritty. Uh, you talked about Mike McDonald, DP, with, you know, wanting to run the football. So I think it's a home run pick in one of those selections that uh, pay huge dividends, maybe not on draft night because it's super sexy. But when you talk about you getting into the months of November and December and the Seattle Seahawks are sitting atop the NFC West, we're going to say it's because of picks like this. Gino Camilleri might be the co-host of the Locked On Eagles, but uh, you can see that that Orrin and Doug's hat he's wearing. Uh, Ducks fan there. Uh, Locked On NFL Draft War Room. Let's go check out the conversation there. He's excited about this pick for the Seahawks. Stinks that he's going up to the to the state up north, but man, you talk about somebody that's going to be a ten year pro at multiple positions between center and right guard. People talk about him as a center. They forget on that line the year before, he was a right guard next to Alex Forsythe, who was just as good at center. He's smart, he's physical, and you're talking about the best player at the Senior Bowl was a junior. JPJ is a true pro. Great pick by Seattle. To wrap up this episode of the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special, let's see what the draft dudes, Joe Marino and Kyle Krabs of Locked On NFL Scouting, have to say about these last three selections. A trio of picks that I absolutely love with these Latest three selections, Troy Fatanu, the offensive lineman from Washington, going to the Saints. Brian Thomas Jr., receiver out of LSU, going to the Colts. And the Seattle Seahawks getting offensive lineman Jackson Powers Johnson. Kyle, I feel like this batch of picks is a tremendous example of teams filling arguably their biggest need with great value in all three selections the Saints with what's going on with their tackle situation, whether it's the recent news with Ryan Ramchek and mm -hmm. his availability for 2024 in question and the lack of development from Trevor Penning at left tackle. This gives them a legitimate answer. I mean, one of my favorite offensive linemen in this entire class, that feels like a, a home run. And I know you've been nervous about the Colts and their pass catchers. Brian Thomas is a nice addition. And then, of course, the Seattle Seahawks have really just their entire interior offensive line from last year no longer in the mix. They had some succession plans in place, but Jackson Powers Johnson 
has the makings of an absolute pillar for that unit for years to come. Well, here's the take for you. Uh, getting Troy Patanu as offensive tackle three when he's a top three tackle and he's not three in this year's class is outstanding value for the Ooh. New Orleans Saints. Is an outstanding football player, man. He is really, really special talent from a functional athleticism standpoint, from a play strength standpoint, from a pass protection. He likes to get hands on you early. Uh, I think he has a chance to be one of the best football players in this year's class, period. For the Colts, they've had a ton of stability with their front office. You got Chris Ballard who went out and drafted Michael Pierce as a height, weight, speed type guy to kind of be that down the field, explosive play type weapon. Uh, lack of route tree has, has really bothered him since he's come into the league. Can't really separate with any level of consistency. I think Brian Thomas Jr. is a more dynamic player. I certainly think that that helps them as they look for putting a bunch of explosive weapons around a young quarterback in Anthony Richardson. You like what that can do, particularly when now you're in conflict of, well, we got to play, uh, with our eyes on the in the backfield because we got to make sure that we are not letting Richardson get loose and carry the football. We need all eyes on the quarterback, and then you, you're you're really going to have the ability to space and and manipulate zone coverages with some of this high weight speed that these guys have. And then Powers Johnson stylistic fit through the the roof for a team that has always wanted to run the football. You get a guy who has rare athleticism at 330 pounds to be an anchor in the keystone of your offensive line. I agree with you. This is three very logical selections in succession that all feel like value and fit that, that intersect here. That is episode three of the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special sponsored by Leaked In Upcoming, the second half of round one. Tune in to find out who your team will pick. And don't forget, you can find the entire special on both audio and video at the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show. Locked on NFL draft and locked on NFL podcast feeds for Matt Williamson, Damian Parson, and Keith Sanchez. I'm Brian Peacock. We'll see you for the rest of the first round in the next few episodes of the Locked On NFL Draft special, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.